Well, thanks everybody for, for coming. Uh, my name is Jason Wood, and um, I work in the security industry. I've been a security engineer and systems administrator for quite some time, and uh, actually now I work for, for Tenable Network Security. Uh, so I've moved kind of out of the operations world to a vendor now. Do they have an office here in Utah? I am the only Utah employee. But we do have a lot of remote positions. So if anybody is interested, come talk to me afterwards because we're always looking for good people. But um, is it just looking for people? <laughs> with some background and things that we need. Sorry, I won't interrupt anymore. Go ahead. No worries. Go ahead and interrupt if you want to. Um, so I decided to, to talk about Security Onion today because really this. Uh, addresses a huge problem I had in my last job where I was trying to manage security and, and monitor what was happening inside of my network and I wasn't aware of this tool really until somewhat recent. I had heard of it and stuff like that but it wasn't until this last year that I looked at it and realized hey wait a minute this is really cool um, so that's why I wanted to to bring this up so this is straight from uh, the Security Onion blog here. It's basically a Linux distribution, bootable off of a CD. You can run as a live CD or install it directly uh, to provide intrusion detection, as well as provide you with the tools you need for NSM or network security monitoring. It's created by a guy named Doug Burks, who is a really nice guy. He's been great. As I've emailed him, asking questions about, well, hey, what about this? What happened here? What, did, you know, what do you have going on on the team right now? Um, it started because he was working on a, uh, SANS cer a certification for SANS. They have a, a level of their certification. You have to write, do research paper, and publish the paper. And so he started working with Snort 3.0, and he was messing with that. And then he started teaching a, uh, a, what they call a mentor session, where they're you know, you've taken the class, you've passed the certification with a high enough score that they allow you to essentially help people in their uh, self-paced um, classes. You know, you download the MP3s and stuff, and we would meet once a week to, to go over the class, and Doug would help, you know, go through the, the conversation, uh, the topics, ask questions, things like that. Anyhow, he was looking at the CD, the virtual machines that was provided by the SANS for this class, for the uh, intrusion detection class. And he thought, I want to do more here. There's, there's more here that I want to, to teach in this and bring up that we don't cover in the class. So that's where Security Onion got it started. He created it for that class and then released it when he was done. And back in, this was 2008, he said. Um, and here was his comment about it in an email. I was asking him earlier this week. Um, I'm a firm believer in NSM, Network Security Monitoring, and Squeal, which is a tool we'll talk about that's part of the um, Security Onion, uh, and wanted to help make it easier to deploy and maintain. So that's really his goal is here's the tool set that I like to use. How do I get this out here to other people and make it easy for them to use? So what is network security monitoring? Is it just IDS? Uh, this is a quote from a guy named Richard Baitlick. He wrote a book called The Tao of Network Security Monitoring, one of his, the books he wrote. This was a quote from his blog as he's defining NSM. You know, we're, the collection, analysis, and escalation of indications and warnings to detect and respond to intrusions. So, you know, we're collecting some kind of information. It's not just IDS information that we're dealing with. We want indications of attacks or things taking place on our network and turn those into warnings. And I looked at that statement, so okay, indicators and warnings, I have kind of my idea what that would be. Here's his definition of that. Indicator is something that happens on your network. Um, some traffic has gone by, you've had an event that occurred, somebody opened a program, output of some application, anything like that could be an indicator. The warning comes in when the, uh, 
you've looked now at the data and interpreted the output of, say, your intrusion detection system and say, okay, well, this was a attack and it's an Apache web server that I can't update because of some stupid application that I'm forced to run on this thing and that attack might have been successful. I, that's, that's an issue. I need to start really looking at this a little bit and see what happened here. So that's what we're talking about with indicators and warnings. All right, bad indicators. This is one of the things I hate with tools that are out there. Um, you get information that does absolutely nothing for you. So I picked on the Department of Homeland Security here because they have great example of a bad indicator. We're at the severe risk of a terrorist attack. Great, what do I do? I don't know. <laughs> do I not fly? Do I not take a train? Do I not go to the store? Am I, what am I looking for here? I don't know. Bad things may happen. And they can't tell you because that would be That's worse. secret, and we don't want to compromise anything here. So we can't tell you. So, you know, really, they can almost do this, and it's about as informative, right? <laughs> Security level today is Elmo. Well, that's probably a bad thing, because I don't really like Elmo very much. <laughs> He's annoying. Oscar, I get a kick out of. Um, so what are some real ind bad indicators? So in my previous job, I had set up Snort, and I was running an application called Squeal to interact with my IDS events and pull back information to decide what's happening. And I worked for a subsidiary of a much larger organization, and their security organization said, you have to run this vendor's intrusion detection system. You can't use Snort. So we went out, we spent a lot of money. We bought this intrusion detection system, which I won't name names. Um, I get it set up, point it back to their console, get the console set up on my desktop, log into it, and I have to click deep down into this thing just to see the alerts. You know, you log into it, you think you would see what's happening. No, I, I see nothing. I have to take five or six clicks down in here, wait. Then I see the alerts, and the alert consists of something happened, now what? Well, where's the information about what you saw? You're scrolling way over this really long list, you know, the scroll bar, and then expanding the box way out, and now I can see kind of what's happening. I have no idea if this worked, or no background information. There's no context. A bad thing happened, or a possibly bad thing happened, or I don't even have any control over this stupid box because the policy was pushed down to me from corporate. So. It was useless, and it just drove me nuts. And there's lots of other applications that do similar kinds of things. Something happened. What? What happened? Why, you know, why is this important to me? And you spend a bunch of time trying to figure out, was this really, really important? So uh, the idea behind network security monitoring is we're trying to add context to it. Oops. Laptop apparently was lagging out there with the virtual machines. All right, so we're trying to add context. We're getting alerts and events and things like that that we would get from our intrusion detection systems, such as Snort or uh, whatever, right? But we're also capturing more information. We're going ahead and we're grabbing session data. What's crossing our network? What IPs are talking to who? What ports are they talking on? Is this unusual? Is it normal that an SSH session gets opened up to this server from this host at 2 a.m. in the morning? Well, maybe. Maybe somebody's running a sysadmin has a cron job that kicks off, and that's part of what happens in my environment. Or maybe this is unusual. Um, but I'll be able to see that pattern because I'm collecting session data over time. And the nice thing about session data is I can gather that information up, and it doesn't take up a ton of storage. right? So I get a lot more context. But we can also do continuous full packet capture. This is going to give us a lot of context, potentially, because now I can see not that 
the host, you know, there was a connection to this server out here and the server responded back and then there was this conversation that went on for a while and then it stopped, I can see actually what happened. There's some problems with that. Biggest one is storage. How much can we store and get away with? Um, if we're working in an environment where we're dealing with a lot of traffic coming at us fast, can we write it fast enough to disk? Um, and then how do we maintain that over a long haul? So those are some of the things we've got to deal with, with full packet capture. But if we have it, it's a great resource here. And the idea behind all of this is not just to collect the data, to get this information and interpret it, but to use it in determining what we're going to do to respond to this. I mean, that's really what we're trying to do. It's great that we got the information, but we need to to be able to do something with it. So that's what NSM is geared up around. So now I threw this in here because I talked about full packet capture. Potentially this is an issue in the environment you work in. <laughs> and you don't want to be the guy who set up a tap or a span port and is monitoring and capturing all the traffic uh, without authorization. You start to look a little rogue. So get, get authorization first. Um, hey, you guys ever heard of Randall Schwartz? Yeah. He writes a lot of stuff for Perl a lot, you know, and uh, very involved in it. He used to work for Intel as a security guy. And a bunch of things happened. He transferred. He moved around. He thought he was doing his job. He's running a password audit, brute forcing passwords and stuff like that. Somebody looked up and said, you're not supposed to do that. And he got hit with a felony. And he spent hundreds of thousands of dollars fighting this. And eventually had it, it was expunged from his record and the whole bit after a decade or so because he didn't have explicit authors. He wasn't doing anything malicious. He wasn't taking over systems. But that's some of the things that can happen when you um, surprise people. And this would surprise somebody. All right, so now that we've talked about NSM, um, we're going to move into Security Onion. And the reason why I want to do that is I want you to see what these tools are doing and providing to you and why we have them here. So here are some of the applications, really kind of a small portion of it, really, uh, that we have inside of Security Onion. The heart of a lot of what's going on here is our intrusion detection systems. And you've got a choice. You can run Snort or you can run uh, Suricata. Uh, Suricata uses the snort rules. So you could go to emerging threats, for example, and get your rules that way. Um, so either one will work here. I use snort because that's what I'm comfortable working with. Uh, Suricata is supposed to have some major performance advantages, though, is that snort is multi or single threaded and Suricata is multi threaded. So potentially some advantage there to us. Uh, Squeal is an interface to interact with your data. Snorby is, an, is a web-based interface. Bro is another intrusion detection system. Uh, Wireshark, of course, I'm sure everybody's familiar with and is used often. Network Miner is actually a Windows application, but it's, we're able to, to run it here inside of Security Onion. Uh, and Explico is a, uh, a network forensics tool, essentially. Uh, web-based, uh, as well as console. These are some of the applications that we have to work with this data and view it and consume it. Um, now, why put together Security Onion? This is just squeal. Okay, this is a, a diagram from the NSM wiki as to how data flows inside of squeal. So we're dealing with full content. SANCP provides us our session data. We have our snort alerts. We have another system called PADS, Passive Asset Discovery System, I think it was. All of this is reporting in through various agents, going to Squeal, uh, Squeal D, and it gets logged off to the database. And then we use our client to interact with it. Now, here is why I like Security Onion. This is what I was running inside my environment. I love Squeal for an interface. It gives me a lot of information um, about what's happening before I had, has anybody used Snort with base? Okay, what, you, what do you think of base? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the guy who picked up the Orphan Project and 
it was, used to be called acid and then it became base under a guy named Kevin Johnson. Kevin's a great guy. Um, he just was trying to keep this thing going and stuff like that, but it's not a real great interface for a lot of stuff. And I got frustrated with it. When I found Squeal, it became really a lot more useful to me. But this is a pain in the butt to set up and manage. I spent hours not setting up Snort, setting up Squeal and getting things running. And I always still had trouble with my session data trying to manually do this myself. Um, now, my employer did not pay me to spend time setting up Squeal. I mean, yes, you need to set it up and so you can get your security data, but they wanted me responding to security data, not um, trying to keep things running or get them set up. And I was dealing with a distributed environment. I have networks in various places. So you finish getting this one. Now you go over to this other system. Now you go over to this other system. Oh, by the way, I need to somehow get this all back to some sane method of monitoring it rather than having six different distributed systems out here. Um, so it's a real it's a pain, honestly. Um, once I got it up, it's great. I mean, I, had, I, I was able to respond to things that were happening, and I found something one time where I'm, I get an alert telling, you, uh, telling me that, hey, I saw something you need to look, like, look at. This looked like a social security number crossed the network on port 80. And lo and behold, we had coded an internal application, and the developer hadn't bothered to require HTTPS, so we were passing this stuff in the clear all the time. Got that taken care of. So... The issue here is setup and security, or setup and maintenance of this, and, and trying to manage my time effectively. So I'm going to go ahead and do a demonstration now of installing Squeal, and I'm going to go, or not Squeal, Security Onion, and getting it all set up. Um, and not only am I going to set it up, I'm going to go ahead and do a distributed environment. Uh, two sensors here. Uh, and hopefully this works. I thought this was funny. I made a comment on Twitter about I'm going to tempt the demo gods on Saturday. And I got a reply back from the demo god. <laughs> this may be ominous. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. <laughs> Twitter's a lot of fun. but that, that cracked me up. And I looked at that and I went, OK, I've got to, I've got to put that in. And let's see. Oh, come on. <laughs> and here he is. <laughs> OK, this is a feature of VMware Fusion, which apparently prompts me. I can't configure these boxes to just have access to go into promiscuous mode. All right, next one. Oh, well, that explains it. Screen saver. I disabled that in my test environment, and I didn't disable that here. All right, let's kill it in both places. Great. So I have two virtual machines here, the Uber Security Onion and the Peon. And when you do, this is just basically a stall of uh, Ubuntu. I patched it, installed VMware tools. That's all I've done to these hosts. So you get this ready to go. Double click the setup. And now we go ahead and get started. So go ahead and yes, continue. I'm going to go ahead and use the advanced setup. And in this case, I'm going to install, we have our choice. We can install the main server. We can install just a sensor, or we can install both on the same host. So for this one, I'm going to go ahead and do both. Select OK. I'm going to go ahead and use Snort. What interface? If I have multiple interfaces, this is going to let me to pick those. Um, I'm just going to use Emerging Threats, and I'm going to hope. Actually, I better check something before this. I'll just give it a shot. All right. Hopefully, my network access is still up. So we'll go ahead and 
What's your username for Squeal and Snorby? Uh, what's your username? You need to use an email address for Snorby. And I'm going to use a really bad password at this point. All right. I've now gone in, fed all of my customization to it, telling us, okay, first thing we're going to do is we're going to set all of the systems to UTC. Time synchronization is a big deal when we're dealing with this type of stuff, uh, particularly in a distributed environment. And then it's going to go through and do the configuration for us. And here we go. And hopefully this will work pretty well. Now, this is one of the cool, you see the OSX restarting? That's a file host integrity monitoring system. Comes on Security Onion by default, running, monitoring everything, and it shows up in the squeal interface. So if I, something changed on my host, I see it. Does it install OSX as a server or an agent? Here it's installing it as a server. Yeah. Can you tie it into an existing system? Probably. I haven't done that myself. Um, all of this stuff, I mean, really what you're looking at with this is you're seeing all of these different applications that I'm sure you guys are familiar with and different implementations separate from each other. They aren't written to be a single project here or anything like that. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. I can't see this. Um, please? No. No. This is like the last room here with Aaron who's having trouble with resolution. I was wondering if this was going to be an issue. Yeah, we're just going to hit enter and hope for the best. All right, there it went. <laughs> Hopefully it worked. Right. So, okay. Now, one thing I need to do here real quick. Let's get the IP address of this, this thing. I have now Snore up and running, running the Emerging Threats rule set. It squeals up and set up. It's now capturing those events. I'm capturing full traffic, session data, everything. I'm done. That was on a laptop running, you know, dying underneath these virtual machines five minutes or so. So major improvement uh, over what my had... Uh, done in my last environment. Now I'm over on the, uh, the peon. I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing here. Double click my setup, say yes, continue. I'm going to use advanced. You can go ahead and mess around and use the basic, but in this case I'm just going to do a sensor. And Put in the IP address or host name of your main console. I'm going to use my username to log in via SSH and run via sudo. We'll go ahead and keep snort. This is going to look all the same here. Proceed with the changes and away it goes. And then a terminal is going to open up here in just a moment. Log in via SSH, provide the sudo password, and now the system is going talking to the master server out here, setting up a new sensor inside of Squeal, populating the database with everything it needs, and uh, when it finishes, I'll have a distributed environment. Sweet. That's it. Um, now, I'll go ahead and comment on this. We're running a GUI here with the screensaver that turns on by default. This is not what I prefer to do on my servers. Uh, so that's something I would probably be changing. But um, makes for an enticing way of doing things to go ahead and deploy this out here and then go back and disable X. and. And a lot of the stuff. So, does the setup have a, a curses or to an environment to set it up, or do you have to? You have to go through that GUI. Essentially, what it is, though, is it's just a bash script wrapped up into a GUI. So, you could go back and look at that and change that. Um, 
I mean, keep in mind, this is something that Doug has been doing since 2008 until earlier this year, all by himself, providing really pretty frequent updates, new tools, stuff like that. Bro, I showed, and Snorby are two tools I've talked about uh, on that main slide of, that are included. He just added those in the last six months. So, yes, there are things that I look at from a systems administration standpoint and kind of scratch my head a bit. You can work around it. So. But, you know, for what it does, I just deployed two sensors in a short amount of time and very little headache. So that is the process of, of going ahead and, and uh, doing the installation. I'm going to go ahead and launch Squeal here, and this is going to look awful due to resolution. So I have some screenshots that look a little bit better. Um, oops, that's my box at home. Oh, that's right. Okay. And we can see, and it's not expanding real well, but you can see now the sensor we set up first, and then our other sensors, they're unmonitored right now because nobody's logged in. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and monitor them. So I select all, start squeal. There's my IDS information. Already starting to populate. So that's how simple it is to get it rolling. And that's one of the things I thought was just stellar about this because of the amount of time it took me and the difficulty I had getting some of these tools to work together. They're all working now. I use this at home. This is how I monitor my network at the house. Um, some things we can do to manage the configuration inside here. Of course, we can do our ID, uh, customization of IDS events. Things look a little different. Normally, if we deploy a snort box out there, we're going to look in Etsy snort. Well, it's now an Etsy NSM. He's been, the snort directory is there, but he's, because he's combining all of these tools together, he's, uh, we've got a, a dedicated directory to that. For that. We can go ahead and use threshold.conf to suppress or slow down alerts that are just kind of chatty and don't particularly apply to our environment. We can disable SIDs of specific alerts. So what we use to update our rules is a script called pull pork. The cron job is set up to run every day. It downloads it, um, our rules from emerging threats or from source fire. So if I was to go out and purchase the subscription to their rule set, I can put in my code there and get that. Or I can use the free one that's a month delayed in your rules. Um, but then I can tell pulled pork, you know, this SID right here, I don't want to ever see this in my environment for this particular rule. And I can disable that and it won't turn it on. Um, all of the rules from pulled pork get tossed into local.rules, or excuse me, download.rules, and then I can use local.rules for my own custom rules. They won't be overwritten during the updates. And this is a little different if you're going to manage all of these different processes, and there are a lot of them, and they interact with each other, he's written all of these scripts to allow us to go through and manage them and um, keep things coming up in the right order and going cleanly and all that other stuff. So uh, user local lsbin is where you'll find them, and they all start with NSM. Maintenance tasks. So one of the cool things that he has done is built everything he's installed so that I can go ahead and keep this thing updated with the normal apt-get update process. It doesn't break anything. For example, with Squeal, uh, it's written in uh, Tickle uh, because the guy who started it, as he put it, had a Tickle book and didn't feel like going out and spending the money on another book. <laughs> um, <laughs> the guy who wrote Squeal is actually the director of incident response for GE. and um, extremely smart guy and really nice. I've logged into the IRC chat room and asked questions and he's, you know, hey, what did you think about, you know, you should consider doing this or here's an issue you want to look at with your IDS deployment. His name's Bam Vischer, great guy. Um, but anyhow, Doug has built this so that we can go ahead and do the normal maintenance and we're not going to break uh, our install. So because of some stuff with Squeal and the latest version of Tickle, he's got that held back, but everything else will update. 
Um, you, of course, want to back up your data. We're collecting all this information in MySQL database and in the file system. If it's going to be any use to us over time, then we need to back this up and, and make sure that we can reference it later if the, the box dies like they do. And then we want to make sure that we're updating Security Onion regularly. If you go to securityonion.blogspot.com, you'll see Yeah, here's, here's the site, and I'm killing my laptop right now with those machines. But he'll do announcements in here telling you, hey, this is now available, it's all coded by the date, and, you know, here's how you go about your upgrade. So monitor that because there are a lot of updates there, and he's doing some, you know, releasing new tools. Uh, pulled pork to do our IDS update. Those are configured inside of Etsy pulled pork. Our rules will all be in Etsy NSM rules. And disk space. I've talked about capturing all of this data. And this is something that I would run into with my previous setup. You come in one day and you realize, crap, I'm running low on disk. It's time for me to start taking care of some things. Security Onion already does maintenance for disks, disk space. You get within 30% of disk space utilization and it starts pruning off old records. You'll never come in and find a full hard drive where you've stopped capturing information. You're just going to lose historical information. So you want to make sure you have enough storage. You may want to look at an archiving methodology if you have that in your environment. Or you may not care and you may look at it and say, no, when it starts archiving that or deleting it off, Fine. I'll have four months of data. That's all I need. What do you do at home? Um, at home, I've got a pretty big hard drive on this thing, so I haven't hit the limit yet. And really, I, I let it just go to the default um, because I'm not worried about legal requirements at my house that I have to have events back a year, for example. I've seen that in contracts. Um, so. I don't care, particularly. I care that I can go back last week and see what my kids were doing online. And we'll take a look at a tool that I use for that. It's not intended for it, but it works really well. <laughs> um, so, but that's what happens with disk space. We need to be aware of that. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a thing of dealing with whatever our environment is. And I had specific requirements. You've got to maintain this kind of data online ready to be accessed. If it's on tape after that, that's your, your own deal. Updating Security Onion. Okay, this is the process of how we do this. Doug does the release, it goes up to SourceForge. He's got dev packages all set up to do the install. But we have this terrible, ugly looking one-liner that he's created here. Really all we're doing, we run the sudo command, we pull the, this uh, security onion upgrade.ssh file from SourceForge down to our file system and pipe it out to our current directory. And then it runs it. I can never remember the syntax of this thing to save my life. So what I did is I just put it into a shell script on my, inside my home directory. Oh, it's time to up, update. I log in, dot forward slash go. And it does the updates. And what happens at this point is uh, Security Onion goes out, looks, sees what version it is, pulls down the dev packages. If you get a few releases behind for some reason, it'll see that I'm on the January release and I had three February releases in a March before we get to today. So I'll do the first February, the second February, and does it in line so we don't have any issues with the upgrade process. I haven't had any problems. Knock on wood. Right? It's, it's worked really pretty well. I've seen bug reports, but I've not seen anything catastrophic. So a little bit of trust here, but I mean, honestly, we go in and we do app get, app get update and upgrade. We're kind of doing the same thing. But that's the upgrade process. Any questions or anything so far? All right. Let's start taking a look at some of the tools that we get. First one I wanted to point out is Snorby. This is actually written by a guy I work with, oddly enough. Um, and it is a replacement, if you will, for base. Um, it's written in Ruby on Rails. You log in, 
and you start getting information about trends happening inside of your environment. Now this isn't terribly interesting uh, necessarily for you, but I can see some things here that happened right away, such as I downloaded a PCAP for a demonstration here of some malicious software uh, executing on a network and it got flagged. That's a back door, Trojan back door, and it lists off the detail. I know you can't see it here really well because of the, the screenshot and the resolution, but that's what happened. So, I mean, it caught that coming across my network. Um, trends over time, you're going to get a pretty default install of Snort. You've down, those who have downloaded Snort, and you set up the rules, how chatty is it? Very, very chatty. And if you install emerging threats, it's extremely, extremely, very, very, very chatty. So you're just going to spend some time customizing. I'm still working through that process and suppressing things that are just nonsense. You know, I don't care that Dropbox is running on my network. I kind of expect it, actually. <laughs> Inside my last job, I'd be running around trying to figure out, okay, who had that IP and what are they doing? What's going into that? Uh, but anyhow, trends over time, Does something, is something unusual happening? Do I have a spike you know, occurring? I can go ahead up here at the top, last 24, today, yesterday, etc. I dig in and I go into my alerts. And here's a, an image of a, or excuse me, a screenshot of, of a particular alert that I selected. And which one is this? Oh, this was that Trojan that I commented on uh, from downloading it. So here's a, this is a real, you know, real alert. This would be something to investigate. And, uh, but we can see the IP addresses that were involved. In this case, this is my laptop, uh, source port, destination port. So the request came from my laptop to their web server, references to it, and go ahead and have a packet capture down here at the bottom. And I can see what con was contained in it and stuff. It's pretty easy to use. It's pretty easy to find things in and stuff like that. So it's not a bad tool. And it's very fast, very responsive, and it's maintained well. It's, it's, it's being kept up to date and current. So this is a, a new addition to Security Onion as of, I think, December last year. Another option we have to looking at information is Squirt. Now, Squirt is geared up towards uh, kind of a web interface for Squeal. Written by a different guy, but he wanted to have a web view into what's happening. And what you can see here, um, events that have been recorded during a given time period. I have my navigation bar up here. Here's a list of my sensors that it knows about. And what data am I getting? Is it SAN CP, is it SNORT, PADS, or uh, OSSEC information? How many alerts do I have of each? And inside of Squeal, we'll take a look at this in a moment, you have different classifications that you, as you're working and doing your analysis uh, on, on things. Is this a um, system that got compromised and we had somebody run um, a root shell? Got a root shell across the box? Do we have a denial assert? We can just kind of classify that in here and it helps us to go back into our reporting and get it out of our view or escalate it, whatever we want to do. But it gives us a view into that. Now, I haven't done anything, any processing on those last 24 hours, so you don't see anything showing up as this was an unauthorized user access and we had four events like that. Um, if you're into where is this IP located at, you know, we've got maps of the IPs. You can do geolocation and things like that. So I don't use Squirt particularly. Instead, I spend my time here. This is Squeal. Like I said, it was written by a guy named Bam Fisher, and he wrote it because he does traffic analysis all the time and everything else he was dealing with sucked uh, to try and see the data. And he wanted the data readily at hand, didn't have to navigate in five or six clicks after logging in to see what happened. Uh, it pops up immediately. Here's all of my alerts. We've got some initial severity going on here. Um, as to how big of a concern is this going to be. We can see what sensor it occurred on. Do we have an alert that's firing multiple times? Here we see this has happened 55 times. So the count, it, I'm seeing the same thing, same host, but it's incrementing. Uh, so 
You know, maybe that's something we want to look at. We have something active occurring. IPs, ports, you know, all the normal stuff, time, what's happening, you know, what was, this is being pulled from the snort rule itself. And then down here at the bottom, we've got a couple of check boxes to go ahead and show the rule or, um, and show the packet data. And we, uh, it's, these are disabled when you log in. You turn on the check boxes when you want to. There is sometimes a little bit of lag because you're querying a, a MySQL database that could have a lot of records in it. You got some tools over here for IP resolution, who is queries, things like that to start helping you out as you're doing your response. One of the things that they do inside of the Squeal configuration is you specify the DNS servers that Squeal is going to use. It doesn't use the operating systems. And the reason, and it uses OpenDNS by default. And the reason for that is you've got an attacker coming after your environment. He's done, I don't know what's in my environment, but all of a sudden he starts seeing a lot of DNS queries for his IP addresses. Well, that may be a problem if he's paying attention and Good, I may have tipped my hand to the fact that I'm investigating him. Um, so, put that out here off to the side. Now, of course, what I'm doing it on, the, it's still crossing the network, so if he's viewing traffic, I could still be hosed. But then that's a one way to try and avoid tipping off your attacker that something's happening. At this point, this is what we had in Snorby, right? Here's the alerts, here's the data, great. You right click, but it is, we have more available to us. Right click over here on the alert ID, and now we get a transcript of the traffic. Or you just dump it into Wireshark and it pulls back the packet capture, extracts it from the much larger packet capture, and now I'm in doing my analysis inside of Wireshark instead because that's what I want to do. But here it is built right into the tool. I can see you know information that we had before. But now we're pulling out information from the HTTP request and what's going on and what was the response back from the server and it scrolls on down and you can't see that in this particular screen capture real well, but you can see up here in the upper right, they have the little gray thing for my scroll bar, right? Um, a lot of information here. Again, I'm adding a lot more context to what's happened here. Now I've gone from something bad has happened, the IDS is waving its arms, to okay, something bad has happened, what is it? Well, this happened here, and then the server responded back like this, and this was the data that was shoved across the wire at you, or off of this server to him. That's useful to me. That starts giving me a lot of information about what I need to do to respond to this. And again, back to that idea of NSM data is guiding our response, not just giving us information. Session data. So you go up here to the top, which is not in this, there's a menu up here, you go to query, and I selected to query SAN CP data. Um, I ran this query on my laptop for one day, and it returned a thousand rows of every connection my laptop made. Now I could tweak my uh, query in the whole bit and instead of having a whole day focus on between timestamps. I mean this is just a MySQL query up here um, is all we're seeing. But I can start getting the session information as well as that transcript. So again more context. How long have these hosts been talking? How many times? So now I'm going to go ahead and try again with another demo and see if we get lucky. Um, over here in my analysis, oops. Over here in my analysis view, I'm gonna open up my terminal and I've got some packet captures I'm going to replay. So first one is this malware.cache. I downloaded from a site, uh, PCAP, r.com. You can go out and download different packet captures that have been submitted and take a look at them and see what's going on out there. Um, and then Xmas 2011, that was actually from a guy named Ed Scotus. He wrote a Christmas challenge last year. Um, fake forensic challenge, figure out what happened in the whole bit. He included a PCAP of it. So I snagged that because it had things going on. So I'm going to use TCP replay. And 
play it on my main interface here. Cache file. Oops. Okay. Oh, I know one thing I forgot to put in here. I knew there was a switch. If you're using TCP replay, the Tash T may be your friend because it'll sit there and wait for the timing mm -hmm. otherwise. Um, that Christmas challenge would have taken 12 minutes to play as I found out. So, oops, I messed up my command. What did I do? Illegal option, okay, fine. Oh, I had an L in there. Yep. What? E zero? Oh, thank you. There we go. So I've now replayed the t 67 packets there. I'm going to go ahead and run the Christmas challenge. 1,200 packets there. We go over here and look at squeal. And we should start having a lot more information, which we're not going to be able to see because this is all <coughs> truncated off. Dang it. Let's see. All right. I was wondering how this was going to play in, but unfortunately I don't have a projector at my house to experiment. All right, well, I think the demo gods just won on that one. We'll take a look at some screen captures instead. Anybody ever seen this comic, this particular one? Cracked me up when I ran across it. Yeah. Well, I was going to walk through the steps that we really saw here and show you how quick it can go when you're doing this analysis. Essentially going out, pulling back the transcript and seeing what was going on. Uh, the, the Christmas challenge, you're watching somebody log into an FTP server that had been compromised using an anonymous FTP account. Essentially what was happening, if you go back and read that particular challenge on um, uh, Sans pen testing blog, grandma got ran over by a reindeer while she was faking her death and so she could collect insurance money and pinning it on Rudolph. So she was uploading uh, SQLite.exe to Rudolph's desktop after she had compromised it and was inserting geolocation data, putting her at the scene of her death. <laughs> So Rudolph was on trial. It was a fun little challenge. If you want to go back and tinker with it, it was, it was a good time. Um, but that was what I wanted to show here, is just how quickly and easy it is to go in and start, okay, this is of concern to me, pull it up and start doing my analysis from there. Um, another tool that we have to interact with session data is Argus. It's a command line utility. It has a large number of different tools available. Uh, you can plot directly to graphs using GNU plot, has commands built for that, or just toss it out to a table here. So here I was running RA command, which is your Argus query, main Argus query command, against a specific log file looking for the host being my, the IP of my laptop. And I just tailed it real quick here. You can see a lot of HTTPS and some chat traffic, XMPP, right? Um, this is not necessarily something I'm going to monitor all the time. I might do some customized scripting and so I can monitor frequency of communication over time. Um, 
so I can spot something up here differently. Um, for example, um, SSH attacks against our Unix host that we have on the internet. Not terribly unusual if you have it listening on port 22 still. It's just, it doesn't signify anything to me, right? However, if I have it on some high port and it starts getting hit and it looks like something might have been su successful, now it's very important to me. And um, it's just that difference in change or, or the, the noise level that we have in our environment. Argus helps us to do that. It's used a lot for in the incident response program to go, or process to go back and see what happened, who was talking to who. Forensics guys are also going to use it as they're building their timelines. And we'll have all of that recorded. This is all running on those two sensors that I configured. I haven't, I haven't touched it other than that, that wizard. HTTP pry. So also, we're capturing all web traffic going across our network. And it's going ahead and snagging get and post data. So we're not dependent on it just being in the URI to know what happened. Uh, it'll go ahead and put all the post parameters in the, the log file as well. This, uh, is all, all this data is going to be under slash NSM, sensor underscore data, then the, inter the sensor name. If I had multiple interfaces, you know, the sensor name ETH1, ETH2, ETH3. And then in this case, HTTP pry or HTTP ry or I keep thinking pry like I'm digging into things. Anyhow, here's an example of it. This is what I've used. Um, in this particular case, I'm seeing uh, Outlook on my work computer on a separate network in my environment, downloading a plugin, you know, the, the plugin status because I keep track of that. New things coming out, right? But I've used this when my wife has come to me and said, I walked in and Tony was a little jumpy on the computer. What was he doing? Uh, let me go see. Tell her what sites he's been to. Here was what he was doing, stuff like that. There's an obvious weakness here. It's SSL encrypted. Kind of stuck. That's where a proxy server kind of becomes a lot more useful to us to have it terminate that. But it's a good tool, it's useful, and a lot of bots and things like that are going to use HTTP as well. So if we had something get infected in our network, we may see trying to blend in with web requests out there. Um, some resources to go to, securityonion.blogspot.com. We've got a wiki for it up there that's a little thin, uh, to be honest, but there's some good information there. The mailing list is very active, and uh, if you have a question, Doug responds back really fast, or somebody else who's now helping him maintain or test is responding back. Uh, really helpful mailing list. I haven't seen anybody come off and say, you stupid idiot, what are you doing? Why would you do something like that? Oh, no, here's you know what you need to consider and do. Very good group of guys. Uh, and then, then the blog, blog in particular for monitoring new updates. You can also use Twitter. If you follow Doug on Twitter, he'll put out, you know, hey, I just did a new update. Um, I kind of like Twitter because I got my current job off of Twitter. So it's been a great source of information. The NSM wiki, not related to Security Onion, but it is related to almost all the tools that we talked about and techniques and things you want to consider and do. Um, and then Security Onion on Freenode. Talk to the guys who are using it. Any questions? Yeah, uh, how will how will the Security Onion run on CentOS? particularly in like a web server kind of remote environment. Okay. Um, so CentOS is, or excuse me, Security Onion is built as a live CD in the whole bit, so you kind of get the operating system and everything installed with it. If you watch the update process, you're seeing dev packages get, everything's in a dev package, gets downloaded and pulled to it. So I don't know that it would work well at all trying to deploy it on like a web server. But what I would look at doing in that environment is going ahead and saying, okay, um, a lot of us have virtual, you know, servers out there we can set up VMs on pretty readily. Um, or we have a, some swing gear laying around or whatever. I would look at putting a sensor out there 
using a tap or a span port on my switch to mirror traffic to it, and now I start getting all of this information. It's not running on my web server. If somebody popped the web server, they're not going to see all of this stuff happening. Now I might go ahead and install the OSX agent on it and send it off to, uh, to the squeal server. So I'd have that data there. But yeah, yeah, it's not something you're gonna go install on one of your endpoint systems. So it's kind of more of a, a tool for uh, just kind of monitoring network traffic as opposed to intrusion protection on an actual block. Right, yeah, I mean this is, Security Onion is a great tool to do this network monitoring collection of tools, really, to do all of this network monitoring. I will not say that it is the 100% everything, you know, this is all you need to deploy inside of your environment. No, not at all. If I was monitoring uh, a web server and this is what I do, you know, it's Apache and I've got mod, uh, mod security running on it, logging things and rules set up to block and I'm watching that and tuning and things like that. Um, you know, there are different things I would be doing as well to add information to, to what's happening inside of my environment. But from the network perspective, this is a great collection of tools and it just takes nothing to set up and get configured. Like I said, that was days of work turned into minutes and I went, crap, I wasted my time. <laughs> I didn't waste it. It was great information, but uh, still. You ever set it up in line? No, I haven't set it up in line. Um, so Security Engine is configured by default to just be listening passively, but it is running snorts and you can run it in line. Um, but that's not something you would do out of the box with that GUI. So you would walk through the process and okay, now it's time to go in and start reconfiguring snort a bit, stuff like that to deal with that. I've never done it because I don't trust inline devices. I've done that once. And I put a web application firewall in front of a website. It was a QA site, fortunately. Um, and I said, okay, don't block anything. Just monitor. I want to see what's happening. And it started blocking nonsense anyhow. And ever since then, I've just been, and I couldn't get it to stop. And you're talking to the support. And they're saying, no, it should be fine. No, it's not. It's blocking stuff. I can see it. So I'm really hesitant to put something in line. That big vendor IDS that I bought, you know, supposed to do this in line. No, we're not. It's not happening. Maybe I'm wrong in that one. I don't know. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate everybody being here. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. And uh, 